All right, so thanks all for coming. Uh, today I want to talk about large language models, the topic of, of intense interest by, by many faculty here. Um, and I think I want to highlight some risks of being too excited about them, but also the opportunities that they enable for problems of safety and broader societal concerns. Um, I'm, I'm imagining that not all of you uh, are familiar with language models and what they've done for the field of NLP. So I, I'm going to open with this kind of slide. And in fact, this slide is now pretty old, but I think it gets at the, the huge gains that have been a result of language models. So this chart shows the benchmark performance on SQUAD, the Stanford Question Answering Dataset. Um, and this is a really classic benchmark that tests our ability to answer questions based on Wikipedia articles, right? One of these classic challenges. Um, and performance had been pretty stagnant. I mean, there were some improvements up to 2018. And you see this like real inflection point where we got this big jump of, of maybe like 10 plus percent or whatever. Um, and this is all really attributable to the use of pre-training, that is the use of large internet corpora uh, to, to initialize our models. Um, and then uh, as well as like a, a particular model called BERT from Google. Um, and so these kinds of systems have really driven dramatic performance. So this is one example from a question answering data set, but just kind of imagine this, you know, several percentage gains applied everywhere in the field. It's a very dramatic change. So they really power NLP systems today everywhere. And so I think empirical NLP systems building 2018 onwards is really this paradigm of you take this big language model, which is designed to sort of predict what words come next on large internet text. Um, and we take these systems and then we fine tune them on some downstream task. Maybe you want to make a system that can judge the quality of a piece of text or whatever. You would take your language model, you would fine tune it, and then this is really how a lot of these things work. So the performance of this paradigm is really impressive. But there's important questions that remain, even though we have high performance. The first thing is can we truly trust them in kind of like high stakes situations? And I'll talk about one example in a few minutes. Um, and the second thing is that this pre-training paradigm, we've, it feels like we've gotten something for free, right? We go on the internet, take publicly available data, and we've gotten performance improvements. What costs are we paying uh, through that paradigm? Are there new risks or harm? So that's the second part of this talk that I want to talk about. So question one is, can we trust these models? And because of the impressive performance that these systems have achieved and the continual improvement of this like pre-training paradigm over the last, let's say, three or so years, people are getting more ambitious and more excited about what we can use these models for. So on the top left, this is a, this is a really nice paper, sort of a, a sort of a inspiring thing by some people from Google Research saying, maybe we can use language models to in fact guide the creation of data sets, right? And that's actually pretty cool and also a little bit crazy because data sets are you know, our most cherished things that guide how machine learning systems behave. And they show some nice results here. On the right, some people have tried to use pre-trained language models plus fine tuning as a way to evaluate models. And that's also another high stakes setting, right? So now we're applying these pre-trained language models to the most critical parts of the machine learning pipeline, data generation and evaluation. And are these models truly so good that we can use them in these kinds of high stakes tasks? So I wanna answer that question in the first part of this talk. The second thing I wanna talk about is new kinds of harms and attack vectors and things like that that arise from the use of language models as part of our systems. Um, I wanna highlight privacy in particular because I think it's a new and unique thing that happens. Um, because we're training these huge models on large internet text, we can now recover various pieces of text from the internet. At first, this seems relatively harmless. Why do we care about the fact that we can recover pieces of text from the internet? But we'll see that there's valid concerns about privacy and the protection of sort of what was formerly hidden information being revealed by these language models. So language models, even though they help performance, they may be very detrimental for things like privacy and cause some serious sort of security risks as well in the, in the process. So um, this really, I think, a lot of my thoughts and some of this work, the directions of the work have been shaped uh, by the Center for Research of Foundation Models. I'm sort of giving a two slide plug here. It's a sort of big initiative with, with many faculty across many departments. Um, and if you want to know more about language models and their use and sort of the background surrounding this, I would encourage you to go and look at the relevant parts of this white paper that we wrote that interest you. Um, the, the title of this talk is sort of a reference and an homage to exactly this white paper. So I think a lot of it I think you'll find interesting if you find this talk interesting. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about two pieces of work uh, that I've sort of recently been doing. 
One of them is in this evaluation metrics sense. Um, what kinds of uh, new capabilities and harms and, and pitfalls might we see when we apply language models to high stakes tasks? So especially evaluation. So I wanna highlight again this like data generation thing because I think it's pretty striking of the amount of trust that we're putting in these kind of language model systems. Um, I think data generation is really an emerging thing. This paper appeared at, I think, the NeurIPS data sets track just last uh, winter. But I think talking to other researchers in the area, this is a thing that people really think is gonna like continue to grow, right? So this is an example of what's called SynthBio. I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail now. On the left side um, is a fictitious biography. This person doesn't actually exist. It was synthetically generated. Uh, of something that looks like a Wikipedia info box, right? So if you go to Wikipedia, you'll see a box that has like a name and their occupation and you know the, the notable works of a novelist. So basically you have this in structured table form and the task is to generate a piece of text on the right. And if you sort of stare at this, it's actually pretty good. This is mostly written by a language model um, and slightly edited by a human. Um, and so the success of these kinds of things really give us optimism that language models can maybe in fact be used in a lot of high stakes tasks, data generation and evaluation. Um, and I think this has been a trend that has been going on for a few years now of trying to use language model fine tuning and things like this to automate model evaluations. Um, and so these are some sample papers. I'm not making a commentary on whether these are good or bad or so on. Um, but they're sort of attempts at taking the high performance of language models and using them to evaluate dialogue systems. Um, so the setup is something like this. You have built a chatbot. You would like to evaluate how good this chatbot is. But of course, chatbots return natural language and there's no easy metric like accuracy that you can compute. The, tr the traditional paradigm is to sit a bunch of users in front of this chatbot and ask them how good was this interaction. That's actually pretty expensive and pretty hard. And so there is this dream, I think, of training language model-based evaluators based on human judgments that we've collected offline, and then evaluating our models against this predictor of how good a human would think the system is. So then we can get low-cost evaluations of our models, and we can sort of improve our chatbots and so on based on this evaluation scheme, right? Like, it's a very compelling vision for how we might eventually replace humans. But at the same, at the same time, you know, there's sort of a question of, are these evaluation metrics really going to succeed, right? In the sense that, can we really build something that's as good as humans? Um, and I think the thing that people have been sort of excited about is the fact that some of these proposed metrics seem to be coming close to human level performance. So on the right side here is a whole bunch of correlations, right? And on the very top you see human correlations with each other. So that's like roughly, not the very best that you can do, but a good sense of what a good system should do. And the next two sets of numbers is like traditional quality evaluation metrics in natural language generation. And at the bottom are these learning based ones that are like powered off of these language models. And you see at the very bottom, like some of the newest methods that people have developed are in like this 0.7 correlation range. That's, you know, the human average correlation. So you see this table, right? Like someone shows you this and then you're going to say, wow, you know, our learning based evaluation metrics are getting really good, right? Like are they ready to be deployed and used and, and trusted, right? But looking at this as a, as a skeptical uh, researcher, you know, it gives you pause because we know that neural systems, especially like language model based systems, they can achieve incredibly high performance and yet at the same time fail in really silly ways. Um, this is an example that I got from, from my student last night. Um, this is a similar benchmark or generation uh, task as the synth bio data set I showed you before. So this is a task of uh, you get as an input some data fields about a restaurant. So this is a restaurant called the Aromi, which is Chinese and so on and so forth. And the task is to generate that sentence on the right. That one was human written, or actually no, this was, this was uh, generated by a model. Aromi is a Chinese restaurant near the Crown Plaza Hotel, blah, 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 right? So if you use a pre-trained neural model for this task, you get beautiful text like this, like you know, fluently written, matches the input, so on and so forth. This is a task called E2E. And I think most people consider this to be a completely solved task around 2020. One of my students even calls it easy to easy. Now, the thing is, it's not really easy because if you replace the restaurant name with Starbucks, which is a completely reasonable substitution to do, um, suddenly the system completely falls apart. Um, it now thinks that the Chinese restaurant is called the Crown Plaza Hotel, which is the thing that it's near, it's not the name at all. 
So it can just blow up in completely unexpected ways when you go a little bit outside of the training data set. And so these kinds of experiences, I think, make me sort of, as a prior, a little bit suspicious of this belief that we can just take models that look high performance you know, in our normal evaluation and then go out and deploy them into the wild or in high stakes settings. So OK, um, my, my postdocs, SNM and Faisal, were, were sort of similarly skeptical. And they were looking into these evaluations. And our, our initial interest was in doing things like evaluating the factuality of language generation systems. Um, and what they found was something a little bit troubling at the very beginning. They found that factuality metrics for summarization tasks had this really weird structure. Like, first of all, they didn't seem to perform particularly well compared to baseline. So if you just measure word overlap, they seem to do quite well. And second of all, they seem to have higher correlation with simple things like word overlap than with human evaluation. And those two combined make us a little bit suspicious. Are they truly learning the task, or are they learning these surface structures? Like, are they learning to just look at word overlap in a slightly more clever way? Um, and I think that's the first thing that I want to emphasize in this first part of the talk, the brittleness of these high performance systems that can arise and the problems that can arise from it. These things called spurious correlations, where a model is picking up these surface level features, rather than the underlying task, they're pervasive in uh, these kinds of automated evaluations, as well as more broadly in machine learning. And what we sort of showed in this set of works is that really they rely on just really simple stuff, like the word overlap to your input, perplexity, which is a measure of compressibility of your sentence, and length of the sentence. These are just really simple stuff that has very little to do with the underlying quality or factuality of generated text. Um, and yet, it seems like these are the things that are driving a lot of the performance rather than understanding the underlying task. So we'll go through a few more examples next. But I want to give you the bigger picture, because not all of you are excited or interested in the NLP or natural language generation evaluation. But I think all of you are hopefully interested in questions of robustness and reliability. And spurious correlations are exactly this sort of thing that is troubling for these systems. So what do I mean by that? There's sort of a standard place where we usually see spurious correlations. And I've talked about this or worked on this in the context of machine learning and NLP broadly. So I'll give an example, and I'll talk through this example. So the, this uh, top thing shown in the, the top half of the slide is a task called entailment. So you're supposed to get in two sentences, like a premise and a hypothesis. And what your task is is to say, is the hypothesis entailed or logically implied by the premise? So here, the economy could still be better. Hypothesis, the economy has never been better, and so that's not entailed from one to the other. Right? So this is a, a classic sort of AI challenge um, in NLP. And what's interesting is that when people constructed the very first benchmarks for this task, uh, there was a spurious correlate. It turns out that crowd workers, when asked to write non-entailing sentences, really like to put negations in. Right? So this is a reasonable human bias. When you're asked to write something that contradicts an input, you might just negate it. right? But what this does is it introduces a really simple spurious correlate or a surface level feature that a model can pick up and then exploit to solve the task. So that's what happens here. So we can sort of think about this in this like two by two diagram on the bottom here. So what we would like to do is to predict the label, whether something is an entailment or a contradiction. But really, it turns out that this thing is correlated with a spurious attribute, whether or not a sentence has a negation or not. And the key thing is that because of the data set bias, we only have, or we mostly have data on the diagonal here, entailment with no negation or contradiction with negation. Because that's true, it turns out to be the case that just picking up on negation is a really effective strategy for predicting entailment. right? This is not what we want the models to learn. And this is the general principle I want you to remember from this first part of the talk, this idea of spurious correlates and how it can sort of deceive us into thinking a model has understood a task when in reality it has not at all. Right? So here in this case, using this spurious attribute gives us low average error, even though there are parts of the space that we're doing really badly on. Any questions on this high level thing? OK. So the problem really is the same thing in this evaluation case. What we would like to predict is something like, in this summarization task, do we have a factual uh, summary or do we have a non-factual summary? And the spurious attribute in this case is overlap. If you're using a lot of words from the original article during summarization, 
you're probably factual, right? So you have this spurious correlate that's really easy for the model to pick up that gives you low average error. On the other hand, we see that in the worst case, when we're looking at examples of non-factual text with overlap, so you add like a negation or something to like intentionally break the factuality of your text, or you're looking at the bottom left of factual but very little overlap where you've paraphrased the summary, in both of these cases, these kinds of evaluation systems would be expected to fail, right? So the way to think about this conceptually is that a lot of the cases where we have spurious correlates, our metrics are very, very accurate in the easy case, right? When the spurious correlates match the label, but they fail sometimes catastrophically in the hard cases where these heuristics that the model has learned are no longer relevant. Okay, so now I'll get into slightly more details of this. And the point of this is maybe not to convince you that this is you know, a truly uh, exciting area for natural language generation evaluation, but I wanna show you the scope of how deep this goes. It seems like this problem is really pervasive. So we looked at a couple different metrics and we looked at a whole bunch of different benchmarks for, for dialogue and summarization, and we really found the same phenomenon across all of them. So to just to remind you, right, these metrics that we picked, uh, mod, dialogue, RPT, and USL, these are supposed to measure the quality of uh, a chatbot system and its response, right? And the higher, the better, because it's more correlated with humans. And on the left side, we've taken some very simple heuristics, just looking at the length, looking at the compressibility of the sentence, called perplexity, or a combination of the two. And what we often see is that these very simple heuristics, if we like carefully figure out what the model's trying to learn, we can actually get them to do better than a lot of these learned models. And that's disturbing. And once again, on the right, we see another disturbing trend, which is that these automated evaluation metrics seem to correlate more with the heuristics, like perplexity or length, than with humans. So on the y-axis here is the correlation with our learned metrics, and we see it's more correlated with the spurious correlate than with humans. So this is kind of the general pattern that we see. These systems are very high performance, but when we put them in situations they haven't seen before, they really seem to be relying upon these heuristics. We see the same thing on persona chat, which is another dialogue evaluation case. You see that most of these learned evaluation metrics aren't doing much better, although USL is doing a little bit better. And on the right side, once again, we see that the spurious correlates are more correlated with the learned metric than with humans. Finally, to drive the point home, this is the very last one. Um, daily dialogue is another dialogue evaluation set. Here, we're basically getting no correlation because daily dialogue somewhat has a different distribution than the data on which these models were trained. So in all these cases, we see a very different story from the original optimistic view that we had. Just because a system seems to be doing well on some sort of benchmark performance numbers doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to do well out of distribution, nor does it mean that it's actually learned the task, right? We can't really trust uh, average case performance numbers on face. We really have to look deep and look at what the system is learning and test it out of its distribution. Um, and so what we found here is that we found at least three different spurious correlates and that they were very predictive of performance and that they correlated really highly with these learned metrics, right? That was the thing that we found, these three things. And I think the key problem with sort of the current evaluation paradigm is that we are testing models on the data on which they are trained. Not literally trained test overlap, but we're taking an IID sampled set, right? But when we take these models and we evaluate them on different data sets, different kinds of dialogues to evaluate, they seem to totally fall apart and they seem to rely a lot more on their heuristics than on actually understanding the task. And so the key point here is that to make progress longer term on these kinds of hard problems, we need something that's more of like a robust evaluation metric, right? We need to take these systems intentionally out of their comfort zone and then test to see what they've learned. Yes? Um, the concern here is about OD performance, right? Like it's right. not like um, a priori bad that it's spuriously correlated or, right. or is it actually a priori bad? What do you mean by a priori? A priori? Uh, like, uh, as, in, as in, if the OD problems did not exist, it, using heuristics would be kind of fine, right? Right, so I, I guess the, well, it depends on what you, what you believe, right? So if you think that the original training data set is truly representative and it's the performance you care about, then you're right. That like, you know, at least for that setting, you do have a good system that relies on heuristics. I think in almost no situation is the training data sets we use in academia actually reflective of the real world use cases or the real world deployment conditions that we expect. They're, a, they're an approximation, right? Hopefully it's a good approximation, but, but often it's not the case. Um, I think especially for evaluation, this is true because you're almost never going to be evaluating the same conditions because you're making a new model and evaluating that. 
And that's almost intentionally a distribution shift. So this is a case where it's really hard to defend that it's going to be IID. But good question. Okay. So, you know, this is a little bit abstract. I'm talking about NLG evaluation, which not all of you are probably, you know, really familiar with. And I think one question you might ask is I've shown you a bunch of correlation numbers, right? Like, you know, correlations can get low. But you might not really care about this. You might say, like, why do I care if the correlation numbers are low, right? Really, the, the thing that I'm going to use this thing for is for developing models. And maybe I can still pick the right models or the best models using these evaluation metrics, even if their correlations are low. So I'm going to now demonstrate a direct harm that can result from using these kinds of evaluation metrics and trusting them. So I'm going to describe the setup in one slide. Once again, I'm going to talk about summarization. So the, the goal is to build a summarization system that can take in an article and produce some sort of a summary. And the interest in a lot of this field is producing abstractive summaries. So you don't want to just take a couple of important sentences. You want to like paraphrase it and synthesize it into a useful summary. That's the task that we're interested in. Um, and factuality is a huge problem for summarization. So we want systems that do not lie to their users when they're performing summarization. So we're going to look at a, a big evaluation data set that some people from Salesforce produced that evaluated 16 different systems and did fine-grained human evaluations for factuality. This allows us to see whether the rankings produced by these automated evaluations match those produced by humans, right? And really, what we can show is actual direct harms from this kind of framework. And I think one thing that's really interesting is people have said something like, actually, these kinds of automated evaluations are really good at distinguishing which models are good or bad. But once again, there's kind of a spurious correlate. I've been talking about this like word overlap thing. And that's really reflective. People find that things with high word overlap are generally more factual. That's just kind of true, right? But really, what we would like to be able to distinguish is the top left corner. If we have a system that doesn't have very high word overlap, can we distinguish how factual it is? And the answer is no. So this is a little story that I want to tell. There's three different systems on this slide. And they come from kind of three different generations or three different time periods. Pointer generator is one of the very first like neural summarization systems developed here at Stanford. Pegasus and BART are much more modern pre-training-based models. And here we see the very top row, human evaluation slowly and steadily improves over time. This is just models getting better, right? But what we find is a very different story for the automated evaluations. If we look at FACT, CC, or DAE, these like neurally-based evaluation models, on the bottom what we find is that these same systems say that the oldest model is the best one. And that's because this oldest model, the pointer, pointer generator, did the least amount of rephrasing. It just sort of copied out parts of the article. Because this, these systems rely on the spurious correlates, they're actively saying these newest best models are actually not the ones that we want, right? And so the direct harm here is that if we were to use these systems to try to rank the factuality of our models, we would actually find that you know, these oldest models are the best, and we would be harming sort of progress, right? So these are kind of demonstrations of direct harms from this kind of spurious correlation that we see. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of, the, some of the details. But the point I will get to here is one thing that we can do is not just rely on you know, the progress of larger models to make our systems better. If we think a little bit more carefully about what's happening, we know that there's some spurious correlates, like word overlap or the length of a sentence. And what we would like to do is we would like to minimize the model's use of those spurious correlates. So we can design an architecture that does exactly that taken from domain adaptation. And if we actually do this, what we find is we will get dramatic improvements in the predictive power of these kinds of uh, automated evaluations on the set of models that we care about, things that do abstractive factual summaries. I'm going through this a little bit fast, but the point here is to say that by explicitly trying to prevent the model from using these kinds of spurious correlates, we can then get uh, improvements in terms of the actual metrics and rankings of models that we care about. And the final punchline here is that I was only talking about robustness here, right? Like I wanted to improve sort of the worst case performance in some sense of these models and make them use more reliable features. But when we did that and we tried to enforce robustness, we didn't really pay a cost in the average case accuracy either. Um, here, the, the, no the error bars are large enough, so I'm not going to say that the adversarial robust model is going to be better than the others, but it's suggestive evidence that actually enforcing robustness could maybe lead to general improvements in the performance of our system. So I think that's a kind of a hopeful note to try to end on here. OK. So, so we went sort of into the low level here, talking about a lot of results and a lot of like failures, specific failures of language models 
So I want to pop back up and, and get to the bigger picture again and talk about that. So language models are increasingly being used in high stakes areas, data generation, evaluation. And I think it's good that we are being optimistic and trying to push the boundaries. At the same time, just because they seem to do well on some benchmark numbers and some evaluations we can concoct, doesn't mean that they're actually good. We need to take a very skeptical view of how good these systems actually are. And so I think that sort of requires us to look at the robustness of these systems to rule out whether or not they're using um, these kinds of simple heuristics or whether they're actually learning the underlying task. Um, and the final thing, which is specific to our work, is there are ways of removing these kinds of things and explicitly building those in rather than relying on sort of scale and you know, more data to solve these problems is a very effective direct approach to addressing some of these issues. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop here in case anyone has questions about the first part. I'm gonna totally switch gears and talk about privacy next. So I wanna make sure that I, I answer any questions that anyone may have about this, this first segment. Yes? Uh, so when you like, um, sort of talked about how you resolved um, or, or tried to tackle this specific issue, um, is that largely through like um, data tuning or is it actually arch architectural? It's actually, I would say more from the loss. Um, I skipped over this because I didn't know how, how deeply I wanted to go into this, but you basically make a neural architecture that has two parts. The top part is the same as your normal prediction task. So you're just trying to predict whether a system is, let's say, good or factual or not. That's the very top half of this architecture. The bottom half is, is an adversarial component that basically says, if I can predict my spurious correlate, like the word overlap, then that's bad because it no means that the model could be using that feature. So I have this adversarial head on the bottom that prevents my model from making use of that. It makes sure that there's no such information in the model. This is all very hand wavy, but I think that's a little bit better than, than digging through the math of uh, the main ad, uh, adversarial neural networks. Do you have yes. to identify those possible spurious correlates? Yes. Yeah, in this case, it's word overlap, which we know is an extremely strong spurious correlate. Yes. Correlate spurious, if the, if the correlation level is higher than what it would be with the human level, okay. Or, or I guess the, the way I would formally define it is a spurious correlation is a, is a predictive correlation that goes away under some distribution shift. Okay, um, and as for like identifying what those are, yes. and, and you know about the word length, uh, yep. and you mentioned about the negation. Right. Do we have a sense of how many other spurious correlates there could be? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we have a, like a comprehensive inventory. I do think perplexity has often been, or perplexity or like simplicity of a sentence as measured by some language model is, is a really strong correlate to almost everything, right? Like if you build a toxicity classifier, for example, you'll find that like toxicity is very unfortunately correlated with, with fluency, like as measured by perplexity. So we have some sense of like things people have talked about, but I think the full universe of spurious correlates is, is completely unknown. Okay, cool. This is, this is a good, good timing. So, so now I want to kind of almost completely switch gears. I want to talk about privacy. Um, so the first part, I think, was partially a, a fully depressing story. It was like, well, there's some great things, but also there's some like really big pitfalls. The second part is, is more, more mixed. And some of this content is taken from um, my class on, on large language models with Percy in last quarter. So now let's talk about privacy and privacy risks. Like, why is there sort of this big issue about privacy that people talk about for language modeling? So one of the reasons is because models are extremely data hungry. I think this is the thing that sets the stage. Um, shown here, um, this is not a language modeling uh, task. This is, I believe, for a machine translation task. But what you see here is on the x-axis, the training data set size in log scale. That's important. And on the y-axis is kind of an error measure, like how many words we got wrong when we're performing translation. And that's on the y-axis um, also logged. And what you see here is this fairly nice line on a log-log scale, right? And what that means is if we you know, double the amount of data set we have, then we'll get some multiplicative decrease in our error rate. But this requires and necessitates that we continually increase our data set size by some multiplicative factor if we want to continually decrease our error rates, right? So that's actually, that's kind of tough, right? It requires ever larger data set sizes in order to get ever smaller errors. Um, and the issue here is that there's kind of a trade-off even, right? The, amount, the kinds of data that we can get our hands on is limited. On the left, we could go to the internet, we can scrape the internet and produce enormous data sets, right? The largest open domain chatbots are generated by looking at um, uh, conversations on Reddit, 
right? There's a lot of those available, right? But they're fairly low quality. Um, that's a subjective judgment. Um, on the right side, we could have really motivated annotators writing down really, really well thought out, careful conversations, right? But those are very expensive. If you're being a good person, you're paying these people you know, a really decent wage, right? And how many samples can you collect? Maybe 10,000 conversations. That's tiny by neural network training standards, right? And so there's a forbidden third path that I think people have started to think a lot about, which is can we utilize things like private user data or even like slightly sketchy copyright protected data when we're training language models, right? There's an ever greater pressure to increase the scope of the data that we collect and use. And this is just kind of a natural dynamic from the fact that our models are so data hungry. And I wanna talk about a really sad example of this. Um, so this is an article that I found while doing my research earlier this year, uh, talking about a South Korean startup which owned a uh, dating app. And the, the dating app was you know, used to share sort of intimate romantic conversations between people. Um, they had this data, so they trained the neural chatbot based on the dating app information. And then they released this neural chatbot to the wild. Um, hopefully you all recognize that this is a truly terrible, terrible idea. Um, and people interacting with this chatbot actually found that they, can, they could get the system to like, emit very intimate details about people's lives back to them. Um, and so this is like a, a truly terrible story, right? I was hoping it was an April Fool's joke, but it's April 2nd and not 1st, and it's actually a real story. Um, and there's going to be more stories like this, right? As, as there's an increasing pressure to build complex interactions and complex systems like chatbots, people will want to leverage these kinds of data. And so I think um, there's going to be an increasing privacy risk that we need to grapple with. When we talk about language models, I think a pretty common thing that people say is you know, either users have consented to the release of the data or we're scraping public pieces or semi-public pieces of information, like say Reddit conversations. Um, so there's really no privacy harm. I think this is a, a common thing that I hear a lot of machine learning people say. But I do wanna stress, um, and this is not a purely machine learning topic, but an important one, that privacy harms do not just come from the release of truly private data. Um, there's a, really nice survey uh, by Salav in 2006 called The Taxonomy of Privacy, in which he goes through all of the different ways in which you can harm somebody's privacy uh, without really actually releasing their private information. Actually, he'll also talk about private information, but also other kinds of privacy harms that you may not have thought about before. Um, and I think the important component here is that there's many different ways to harm privacy, and there's a whole pipeline of privacy harms, right? You could invade somebody's home, and that's obviously a privacy violation. Um, you could collect information, like watch them with a camera. That's a privacy violation. But actually, the thing that's most relevant to us as computer scientists is the information processing component, right? There are privacy harms that arise from taking lots of different data scattered all over the place, combining them into one centralized source. And that's what language models and models do, right? They aggregate pieces of data and they form inferences and generalization. And of course, disseminating that information can obviously have privacy harms, right? So I wanna talk about sort of information processing in particular um, before I talk about language models and like their specific harms and so on, right? Because this is an important higher level point that I wanna stress. So when we aggregate information, this is the act of taking different kinds of public information and combining it together into some other new piece of information. And really you can't avoid aggregation when you're training models, right? Because the whole point of a model is to take information that was scattered in documents across the internet or whatever, and to bring them together into a centralized place, this model, right? And the other thing is accessibility, right? When we release a model, we inherently make it more accessible. Originally, right, to get access to these pieces of information, you have to go crawl through the internet, find all these different pieces of information, and find the relevant things, right? You have to do a lot of research, right? But now there's a sin single central repository, this big language model that you've trained, that contains all of that information in one place, right? It's like kind of the like Google of private information. You can go look everything up. So you could think about a lot of different harms that arise from these two processes. And I wanna outline a couple to motivate what will follow in the rest of this talk. So the first thing is that aggregation can, can violate expected privacy. So the example I like to give for this is, uh, let's say we have a system that can build a synthetic biography, right? So maybe some of you have seen these like weird kind of very sketchy websites 
that will find public information about you, like your address, your gender, where you work, and so on. And they'll like make a website that's like a kind of a synthetic uh, sheet, uh, biography of all the things you know. And they know a lot of different things. It's kind of shocking if you go to one of these websites. They'll maybe even be able to do things like infer your income, right? Now imagine a model doing this at scale. You might type in like Tatsu Hashimoto's biography, and they'll be able to like spit out sort of all the inferences that I can make, right? You know, my, my uh, leanings politically and so on and so forth. That's definitely something that feels like a privacy harm, right? Because I definitely didn't consent to having a system build the synthetic biography with my, some intimate details of my life in there. Other things that can happen is inferences, right? Um, even accurate inferences could be harmful. And one way I think to, to sort of talk about this is like, let's say I have a whole bunch of writing published on the internet through blog posts, right? And then I ask GPT-2 or some other language model, you know, here's the writings of somebody. Like, what is their sexual orientation, right? Building that system can itself be a privacy harm, right? In the sense that you're trying to infer information that is private. Like, technically speaking, that is a piece of information you could have gotten from the, the public text that was, existed. But this is definitely new pieces of information that's much more accessible to somebody. Um, and finally, accessibility can harm expectations of privacy, right? If I have a website that's not scraped by Googlebot, it's technically speaking public, but I have an expectation of privacy. And so the boundaries of what constitutes private information is honestly a little bit pretty loose. Um, so for all of these reasons, language models represent a new sort of frontier of privacy harms and like safety violations for people. Um, any questions? I feel like sometimes this is controversial. Uh, with people who, who especially want to stick to like. I guess uh, a question I had was, so is this, how is this different from let's say me, like taking your example, like Googling about Tatsu Hashimoto and saying, okay, you know what, based on this, I think this is their income, this is their political leanings, and then creating a blog post about it. Is it just a matter of scale? Right, or right, is there right. something else right. that makes this worse than maybe just me doing it? Yeah, so I think, the, the question was whether um, there's a difference between you Googling things and like a centralized system that, that does this. I think the key thing is everything is sort of continuous in the sense that in order for you to find everything about me, it will take substantial amounts of effort, right? Substantial amounts of searching effort and so on and so forth. And decreasing the barrier, the cost barrier to having all of this information available to you immediately um, that's a qualitative difference because whether or not it's going to take you a month versus a day will really change whether or not you actually act upon it, right? Um, and this is a, kind of a good segue because the courts actually have thought about this and they come to essentially the same conclusion um, as me, which is, uh, so DOJ versus reporters uh, com for free press is, is the case that, that is relevant for this. And sort of to give you the background, I believe this was a case in which uh, some reporters wanted access to um, FBI rap sheets. And rap sheets are the centralized uh, inf piece of information for like all the crimes that someone has committed um, and so on and so forth, aggregated from all over the country. Um, and the reporters argued that rap sheets were public information because all the little pieces that went into it, like you know, whether or not you were convicted in like a small town, that is public information. Like you could go to the court records, you could look it up and you could find out, right? So that was their argument. And, and the, the DOJ argued that it was not public because you would have to spend substantial effort to look it up. And that was sort of the, the same uh, logic that was uh, reached by sort of the justices on the bottom here. The issue is whether or not the compilation of hard to obtain information um, alters the privacy interest and the nature of the privacy guarantees. And the argument is that if you have a whole bunch of information scattered across courts and you have to go look them up yourself, that's kind of a different mode of privacy expectation than if it's like directly available to you and handed to you. Um, and also I think the other thing about accessibility that they also noted is important, right? So you know, in conversations that we have and you know, in, in semi-private disclosures, you know, most pieces of information are disclosed to somebody at some time, right? So the notion of like privacy is, is a very shifting quantity. Like at least like things I put on the internet is a very binary quantity, but there's a lot of pieces of information that I share that I don't expect to be disseminated. There's an expectation of privacy component to all of this. So changing the accessibility of, of private or non-private information is itself, they argue, uh, a privacy violation. So I think this is kind of important, especially the legal aspect I think is useful to think about because that is in some sense the kinds of things you'll have to follow when you're making these systems if you're ever involved in making one of these systems. Okay. <laughs>
So I spent two slides talking about sort of the legal and ethical aspects of this, and hopefully that is of interest to you. But now we'll return to the questions of more technical questions about machine learning. For a few slides, I want to talk about um, harms that other people have discovered. This is not my work. Um, extracting training data from language models, some nice work by Carlini, shows that if you have a language model like GPT-2 trained on the internet, you can very easily extract parts of the training data. And so the example figure you should have in mind is something like, if you put in as an input to this model, you know, East Strasbourg, whatever, then the model will spit out some sort of address uh, that was originally contained in the training data. And this is exactly the kind of like potential privacy harms that you could imagine. Um, and one thing that they found, which I found to be really interesting, given the trends in the field, is that the larger the model, the stronger its tendency to memorize. Um, and that's actually kind of an interesting observation. So this table taken from that paper, what they did was they found a bunch of Reddit links um, that was contained in the data set. And it was contained in a very specific place. It was like some paste bin piece of text that was contained. And so they can exactly track the number of times this very specific string appeared in the training data. And so as you go to the top, it's more and more common. So it appeared more times in the training data. And as you go to the bottom, it didn't appear very often. And on the sort of different columns, the memorized column on the right, it's showing which models happen to memorize this piece of text. And they have a technical definition of memorize that I won't get into, but you can just kind of think of it in your informal way. Now, what we find is that this Excel model on the left, the biggest model, memorizes way more stuff than the others. And in fact, like, the more frequent the, the piece of text, the more memorized it is. So what this shows is like if a piece of text appears maybe 30 times in the training data set, the GPT-2 Excel, one of the larger models at the time, will happily memorize that piece of text. Whereas if you have a much smaller model, it won't memorize. And this is an important piece because the trend of the field is to go to ever larger models to improve performance. So this problem is only going to get worse. And there's arguments to be made by, by fairly smart people with nice evidence that memorization is a fundamental property of neural networks. Um, and in fact, with our current training paradigm, it is unavoidable. So shown in this plot is the performance of a, of a language model. And on the x-axis is how long we train for. And there's two different y-axis. The blue y-axis is how much we've memorized. That's a technical term, but you can sort of think about it colloquially. On the right side, is how well our model fits both the training and the test data. And so what you see, let's start with the red lines, right? As you train for longer, training data goes down, and test data goes down to a point, and it comes back up, right? Because it starts overfitting. Now, the blue line, the amount we memorize, goes up as we train more, because we see data more and more times. The key thing to notice here is the point at which our test and train losses are low is also the point at which memorization has peaked, right? And so people look at these kinds of plots and they say, it may be the case that our current paradigm of using large neural networks and public data means that we will inevitably get memorization. Right? This is a thing that we will have to live with in some ways. Um, and so this kind of sets the stage for, for the harms that, that might appear. Um, and so to sort of wrap up this sort of like summary of harms kind of view, right? so large language models have really driven large-scale public data collection, because we know that more data and bigger models are going to help us. They're going to improve the performance of our systems. At the same time, we know that they're going to lead to further memorization, and that could be a form of privacy harm. right? And so using the current approaches that we have now, it seems like this is inevitable. Models seem to prefer to memorize data, and the highest performance, largest models that we have will naturally memorize data. And so how can we get away from this problem, right? Like now we sort of need to try to fix this problem. And now I'm going to talk about that. So one thing that you might begin with and think about that I want to sort of prevent you from doing maybe is to think about simple privatization schemes, right? Just look at some names in the training data, mask them out, look, find addresses and mask them out. Um, the problem is that privacy is kind of a high stakes thing in some ways. If you mess up and you release a model, it's kind of there forever. And even smart people will make mistakes. Uh, this example on the left is some very smart uh, researchers coming up with a way to scramble and privatize data called InstaHi. Um, and it was you know, pub uh, made public on, on February 21st last year, uh, or February last year. And then uh, it was broken just two months later by some security researchers that showed that you could almost exactly recover <laughs> the original pieces of text uh, based on like training information. 
And so even really smart people can make mistakes. This is not to say that this insta-hide thing was a bad idea. This is to say privacy is hard when we don't have provable guarantees. And so what we need is, is some stronger guarantee that we're not going to leak user data that we care about. In the gold standard method, the, the thing that has stood the test of time is differential privacy. Some of you may already know about this, but I'm going to give you the, the kid's version of differential privacy. Differential privacy is a fairly simple guarantee. It says, I have a bunch of users, which people call records in the differential privacy literature. Uh, so I have Alice, Bob, Xavier, Donna, Ernie. And my guarantee is the following. If I train a model using everybody, I will get this blue distribution over a model. So my, my predictor has to be randomized. I have a randomized estimator, and my estimator emits one distribution. And if I remove Xavier, I'm going to have a very similar distribution. right? Like My output of my randomized algorithm will remain close whether or not I have included Xavier. That is the guarantee of differential privacy. And there's a more formal definition, but I don't want to get into that too much. This is really the gold standard in the sense that there hasn't really been strong attacks that were demonstrated against this. And it was used in the 2020 census uh, with some controversy. But it's really something that's hard to achieve. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I don't want to get into the technical bits. Um, but really, the issue with differential privacy is it's such a strong guarantee. It says that when I remove a user, no adversary with arbitrary amounts of side information can determine whether or not I was included in the data set. That is incredibly strong. And prior attempts to applying differential privacy to natural language processing was kind of a complete failure. Uh, I just want to give you a, a funny example here. So this is an example from, I think, a two years ago now, Kerrigan et al., that tried to generate a language generation system using Reddit data privately. Um, and what they had is, you know, this is an example. Bob lives close to the. And then if you have a non-private system, you'll get a pretty reasonable output here. You know, lives close to the station, and so on and so forth. If you use a private system, you get complete garbage. This is not even reasonable English if you look at the continuation over here. And so it seemed for a long time that differential privacy and deep learning were just fundamentally incompatible concepts. Like, you know, you can't even put the two together. And people had very reasonable reasons for believing this. You know, large language models have millions of parameters. Like one typical example is 300 million parameters. So if you think about each parameter as potentially containing a private piece of information, that is a ton of information to privatize. right? So it's really hard to privatize large language models because they have so many parameters, each of which could potentially leak information. Now, theory also agrees with this. It says there are very good bounds that say that differential privacy performance should degrade as the square root of the number of parameters. So now theory matches our intuition. And it also matches empirical results. The only successful DP applications used to be in low dimensional statistics, um, like things like the mean or the number of people living in a household. But that's really not the complete picture. Um, and this is maybe the optimistic part of the talk. Um, we can actually change our perspective a little bit. We've been thinking about language models as the, as the cause of privacy harms. But it can, in some ways, also be uh, empowering us to have better privacy. And this is a slightly different perspective. So we can't train large language models yet using differential privacy. But what we can do is the following idea. We can look for nicely curated public data. Let's set aside the problem of public privacy harms for a moment. Train a large language model. And then use this language model along with private data to achieve privacy. So now we can have privacy on a small subset of data that we truly care about while leveraging large public data sets. And this is kind of the paradigm that I went back to at the very beginning of the talk. I was saying language models have driven enormous gains in NLP through, through a range of subtasks. And the reason is because these models learn really useful things, like syntax of the English language. Right? We don't want to be using our precious private data to relearn the English syntax. That is crazy. right? So we want to learn this stuff from hopefully safe, sanitized public data from somewhere, and then use that to empower our sort of downstream private applications. That's sort of the idea here. And so we, it's wasteful to spend our private data learning this kind of public information. And that's the main idea. So what we found was actually kind of funny. So once we started thinking about it this way, um, we realized that maybe language models actually are useful. So what explains previous failures in using, uh, in using these kinds of systems, sorry, in using differential privacy in language generation systems? It turns out it was something very silly. It was hyperparameters. Um, if you use typical hyperparameters that you use for non-private training, you get catastrophically bad performance. This is uh, performance on the E2E benchmark that I showed you before. And around 60 
is state of the art, 70 is state of the art, and 10 is totally unusable, it's garbage. So if you use a typical hyperparameter for non-private training, you get basically garbage. But this was actually about two orders of magnitude off. If you change the hyperparameter substantially to be more suitable for differential privacy, you actually get close to non-private performance. This was really surprising to us, and we, we had to come up with a, a different kind of explanation for why you'd use these weird hyperparameters, but the naive choices were way off. And equipped with this, we found a very different story. What we found was that you could actually get uh, private systems that were almost as good as their non-private counterparts. So on the left side is a classification task, so you're predicting uh, entailment, which is a task that I told you about. On the right-hand side is the E2E task, the, the restaurant review generation on the right. Um, and we see that as we increase the number of parameters from left to right, the performance gets better and better. The y-axis here is performance, and each of these lines is a private model that we trained. And so larger models, by virtue of their pre-trained language models being better, actually get much better private models in the end. So this runs counter to the maybe belief that people had that large models were hard to privatize because they might be leaking uh, private pieces of information. We actually found that large language models actually give us the opportunity to get even better performance under a stringent privacy guarantee. Um, so in the non-private case, the, sorry, the pre-training is a sort of a small game, but for private learning, the difference is huge, right? So having large models gives us enormous gains, going from unusable uh, performance to go, getting to completely usable and nearly non-private performance. Um, what is the time? We have five minutes left. Okay, so I will talk about one last technical piece and then I will conclude. Um, one really interesting side note, especially if you're sort of more systems or computational people here, is the real technical challenge that we found was not necessarily statistical. Usually people think about private learning in terms of statistics. How large does your data set need to be in order to be able to learn privately? What we found was a really big challenge was computational. Differentially private learning requires a lot more memory than uh, non-private learning. And what we found is, is sort of this following very uh, challenging thing. So for various technical reasons, differentially private SGD is very memory intensive. And so for looking at a non-private uh, training task, we can fit 34 examples in a batch for a medium model or 10 examples for a large model. If we're doing private training, we can't even fit a single example into a, uh, Titan, X, a Titan RTX GPU when we're doing private training. And this turned out to turn into the bottleneck because we were no longer having these statistical challenges because we were using pre-trained models, but we have these computational challenges. And by using various tricks um, involved in like modifying the backpropagation algorithm, what you could actually get is uh, memory usage that was on par to the non-private algorithm. And that's kind of a cool little trick that we developed, but because of that, we can now really scale up, oh sorry, scale up the size of these models and finally get private models that were almost close in performance to their non-private counterparts. Um, so before I sort of conclude um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to just show you examples of what a private system generates. Because I think in generation, you know, I can show you numbers like boost scores and whatnot, but looking at the outputs actually I think is more compelling. Uh, so for the top one, this is the E2E generation task. This, um, you have the table at the top that describes the restaurant. We have the reference that was written by humans. And below that, this is a private version of a neural language model that we trained. So this thing has a very formal and strong privacy guarantee of epsilon of three. Um, and yet it generates perfectly fluent and sort of grammatical and correct uh, restaurant reviews. And so that's sort of the point that we're at now. By leveraging large pre-trained language models, combining that with differential privacy, we can actually get privacy for a lot of these interesting downstream tasks that we care about. And we can get this very strong notion of privacy called differential privacy. And so that's where we're, we're kind of at, right? So to wrap up, right, there, this was in two parts. So the first thing that I do want to, for you to remember is that language models do pose a privacy risk. It scrapes the internet, it collects all this data, it aggregates them, that is a privacy risk, right? Let, let's not beat around the bush here. And large language models will memorize training data. So these, th these threats are real. But at the same time, there's opportunities, right? I was talking about risks here, but the, the flip side of this is that large language models, by virtue of you know, the fact that they can teach you about English grammar and so on, allows you new kinds of privacy guarantees much stronger than what was available before. So even though there's some privacy risks that we get, we also get some other kinds of privacy in return, which is sort of an exciting frontier. 
So I'll stop here. Uh, we'll have a couple of minutes at the end for, for questions if anyone has any. Why is it that the memorization problem can't be trivialized with preprocessing? Why can't the memorization be trivialized with preprocessing? Like, like, tri like trivially avoided, I guess. What do you mean by that? As in, as in you can make the model not memorize data by just not, like by just preprocessing the data somehow. Like for example, you could imagine just running like a simple arithmetic encoder on it so it's lossy. So then by pigeonhole principle, you have some like, guarantee. So let me think about that. So you can certainly noise up your data, and that will prevent memorization. But you will pay a very large price in the accuracy in return. Because your goal is not to predict noisy English. It is to predict English, right? Um, there are certainly, I mean, in, in some ways, OK. So, so there is a truth to sort of what you were, you were thinking about. But it doesn't operate at the preprocessing level. To be very formal uh, about this, like differential privacy is kind of this idea. It says, instead of taking a normal gradient step, taking at the very top, what you do is you take your gradients, you clip them so each gradient is like, you know, bounded in size, and then you add a bunch of noise. And that noise step is kind of like this intuition that you have. But if you just do it in the right way, with the right amounts of noise and the right amounts of clipping, then you can get guarantees. So it's, it's a lot more subtle than just like, let's just add some noise to the training data. Yes? solution that you shared, oh, like, let's not worry about the public data privacy issues, uh, but let's focus on, like, the specific private data we have. Do you think it is worthy to think about the public data privacy issues and whether there is any remedy to having a large corpus with private data? <laughs> yeah, or, or are you, so, so OK, I'll, I'll fully acknowledge, right? The, the first part of this section was like, okay, it's really bad to pretend that private, the public data is public, right? Um, I don't think we have a great solution for that yet, um, but people are working on differentially private pre-training. And if that gets solved, then this whole thing will be private, and we would sort of be able to avoid all of these issues. Um, I guess like, you know, once you solve those problems, there are other additional problems about what does it mean to do differential privacy on internet text? What, what is our definition of privacy? Um, those are subtle questions, but I think we're slowly making progress on all these ones. Yes? Just to make sure I'm on the right page here, um, you took a pre-trained model, um, and then you um, basically did hyperparameter tuning on a private data set. Is that correct? You fine tune on the private data set. Right. So, so the, the hyperparameter story is not that we're doing hyperparameter tuning on the private set, but we needed to just change the hyperparameters when we fine tune on the private set. So it's the, well, I guess we can go all the way back to the very first part of the talk, but it is basically ooh, this paradigm. You have a pre-trained language model. You have a downstream task that you would like to do. So in stage two, you take your pre-trained model and you fine tune it for the downstream task. It's exactly this. Yeah, I think we'll have to wrap up there. Let's see. That's it again.